Welcome, welcome to Empowerment Radio. It is another Wednesday and we have a wonderful guest today and I just talked to her about how much her book has helped me when I read it and how much I will certainly take on as maybe daily rituals, as inspirations, as ways to improve that what she is and has been writing about for many years. Now, how many of you feel like there is a story inside of you? There is something that you want to share. There is something that just feels like wants to come out. How much, how much do you feel like, yes, I wish I could sit down and write, write my story or write about maybe something that you have dreamt of, a fiction, a love story, something that just feels like it wants to be expressed. And how often do you feel stifled? You look at a blank page and it's like staring in the sun and you just look away after several seconds because you're too intimidated, too stressed about making a mistake. Maybe you feel like what you have to say is not really important. Maybe you feel like, well, I don't really want to put something on paper because someone else may read it. And then what? Maybe I get judged for that. Maybe my writing is bad and not only my handwriting, but my spelling and how I express myself. Maybe you just have a block that you want to overcome. And this is what Empowerment Radio is all about, helping you to outgrow those obstacles and really live your dreams because writing is not only something that I believe is about sharing a story, it is also healing and it is transformational. And it is certainly for those that are reading the stories that you leave, something very beautiful and enjoyable. And I wish my parents would have done this because they had many amazing stories that they lived through from being teenagers in World War II to going and um, having to decide, especially my mother, whether she chooses freedom, which was then staying in Western Germany, or chooses her parents, which were stuck in Eastern Germany. They lived a very interesting life as countryside doctors in the Black Forest, where they certainly had uh, experiences that now maybe sometimes we can see in movies, but they lived it. They were you know, going out at night in the winter when there was no car driving on skis to deliver babies. They were not only operating on the, the, pair, the, the, the farmers on the fields, when there was an accident, they also operated on animals because that was just, the practice of a countryside doctor where people came with all their concerns. And so there are many stories that I still can remember and maybe one day I will write them down, but after that they may be lost. And that would be a shame. So if you feel like writing is something that is not only something for you, but also for those that you want to, you know, leave with your history, with your memoirs, with your legacy with, just like, for example, my uh, mother-in-law did this Christmas and all her kids cried because she gave them the chapter that she wrote about their lives and how they grew up. And it was one of the most touching gifts that they ever have received. If there is something inside of you that interests you about writing, I have the person, the expert about writing today on the show. And it is Diana Raab. She is the author of several books about writing. And today we're going to talk about the latest book, but also books that she had written before, Writing and Healing. But this book is called Writing for Bliss, seven, a seven-step plan for telling your story and transforming. And I have to tell you, once I read, the, read this book, it was actually transformational just to read it because there is not just a lot of advice about writing, but there is also how to become a writer, a writer in your own right. So thank you, Diana, for being on the show today. And uh, I know that you're 
kind of, you know, under not so great circumstances, having to flee your home and staying in a hotel. So thank you for making this happen. My pleasure. It's wonderful being here. It's wonderful to be alive. Well, yeah, yeah. Maybe you're going to write about this one day too, what happened there with this mudslide in California. But you're okay and your family is okay. And, uh, yes. Lots of friends that lost homes and loved ones, but uh, we're safe and sound. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Now, how did you get into writing? I mean, that was a fascinating story in itself because you started very early on in your life. I did. And many writers have started uh, early on from traumatic events. And that was my situation. I was 10 years old. My grandmother was an immigrant from Austria. And she was my caretaker in my home in Queens, New York. My parents had gone off to work. And my grandmother was there caretaking me and she was asleep in the morning, didn't wake up. And long story short, she committed suicide while I was home with her. Hmm. It was an overdose of sleeping pills and my mother really didn't know what to do with me. It was the 60s and therapy wasn't a big thing. And so she went out and bought me a journal, hmm. a Kahe Hebron journal. And she said, write your thoughts, write whatever comes to you, write a letter to your grandma. And so from a very early age, I'd always turn to writing uh, during difficult times, during good times, but most often during difficult times, cancers and loss of loved ones. And so for me, writing has always been healing and transformative. And now I share my love and passion with others. Now, your grandmother also wrote, right? And I think through her writing, you actually got a deeper understanding of her story and maybe even what led her to the suicide? Exactly. So uh, my first memoir is called Regina's Closet, Finding My Grandmother's Secret Journal. When my parents moved from my childhood home, I already was a mother myself. Uh, they had cleaned out her closet and found a typewritten journal from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. It was a retrospective journal that she wrote about growing up in Poland during World War I and being orphaned at the age of 11. So part of my curiosity of why she committed suicide, so I was reading the journal, very curious, maybe I would find out why, maybe like myself, she was a cancer survivor, but I ended up finding out that because of her childhood trauma, she's held, you know, we hold trauma in our bodies and she held that on for so many years. And I think finally when she turned the age of 61 and I, became very independent she might have thought i'm hypothesizing that she wasn't needed anymore and so she mm. just... but you, she that. didn't really express that i mean you couldn't see in her writing there was a certain kind of downward spiral in that regard i couldn't see it in her writing um i felt depression in her writing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Her overdose was some valium so she was clearly depressed and sad and stressed. Um, but no, I, I picked up depression. She didn't write up to the time of her suicide. She wrote mainly around, around World War I. Mm. So I don't know what she was feeling the weeks before. Now you, as you said before, used writing as a healing tool. I mean, yes. when you were diagnosed with cancer, you picked up writing again and wrote about healing through writing. So how did writing help you in that time? Well, um, to back up a little bit, so when I became a teenager and I went through difficulties of adolescence, I also turned to journaling and then mm -hmm. I was on bed rest with three of my kids and I journaled that. One of the, one of the um, stories actually turned into a book uh, for, for women also dealing with difficult pregnancies. And then like two cancer survivals. Uh, how it helped me was it, it, um, it was a container for my feelings. The journal was a container for my feelings. It was a friend. It was my companion. Yeah. And on the East End said it was her opium pipe, you know, just something that <laughs> just, <laughs> it just, I, when I was writing, I felt really good. And when I didn't write, you know, my family knew over the years that if I'm sort of tense or grouchy, they would send me to my office to write because that always made me feel better. So when you did this writing, you still I assume you still journal and write because you don't abandon your friend. But when you do 
is this in the process for you a release, a letting things out on the paper, or do you feel like as you're writing, especially when you were dealing with the challenges of cancer or being you know, on bed rest for the children, did you feel there that you were coming to conclusions that by doing it just in your head alone, you would have not been able to reach them? That's really hard to know. I think uh, for me, writing felt better for other, like my brother-in-law read the book and he said, I love it. But you know, for me, talking is my way to heal. I talk to people, I talk to my family, but for me, I, I, I express myself best on the page. So I knew that that was my modality. Mm -hmm. But is a writer in all of us? Yeah, there's probably a writer in all of us. And, and as you said in your introduction, we all have stories and, you know, uh, and stories really haven't changed over time. Like there are people in my workshops, they say, you know, my story is really not that interesting. I did so and so. And I said, well, it's not that your story is not interesting. It's just that, you know, it is interesting because it's your story. And, uh, you know, we've from early, the early days, we've had love, we'd have you know, family, we'd have war, we'd have conflict. I mean, stories haven't changed, but it's our perception of them and how we see them that has changed and that makes our stories different than the next person. And isn't it also true that the writer does ultimately need only one reader, which is oneself? I mean, we're not necessarily having to write for a bigger audience, which I believe a lot of people are intimidated about. You know, oh my God, how will I get judged and criticized? But just the writing as a, you know, a transformational process in itself. I think that is what your book is also about. It is not just about aspiring authors. It's just getting writing into maybe a, a practice for healing and self-awareness. And that's what we want to talk about in the next segment, because especially how you approach it is so beautifully laid out and so easy to follow that I believe everyone can become a writer with your book. When we come back, we'll talk more with Diana. Oh. Welcome back to Empowerment Radio. I am here with my fabulous guest, Diana Rapp, the author of Writing for Bliss. Now, you also wrote other books, which are one was Writing for Healing, and uh, what other books did you write? Healing with Words was the one I think you're thinking of. Uh, yes. uh, healing with Words which was uh, about my cancer journey, my first cancer journey. And it was, it's actually a self-help book, self-help memoir. And then in uh, Regina's Closet, which was about my grandmother and my relationship with my grandmother. Then I wrote a book called Writers and Their Notebooks, which was a collection of essays that other writers had given me about how writing had helped them, how notebooks have helped them in their journey. Mm -hmm. And then I have four books of poetry, because that's kind of my side passion. And then my first book was called Getting Pregnant and Staying Pregnant, which was started as a journal about my difficult pregnancy on bed rest. And then I ended up elaborating it to make it like a self-help book for other women going through similar circumstances. And so this book, the latest book, what motivated you to write that? That's a really good question. I think what motivated me was that I give a lot of workshops on writing for healing. It was my students that motivated me. They said, you know, we love your workshops, but when we go home, we don't really know what to do. We need, mm. you know, we need to do. So can you write a manual for us and, uh, so that we can take it home with us? So it was basically my students. And actually it was, in the end, it was based on my dissertation uh, in psychology, which uh, I, where I studied writing for healing and transformation. I interviewed five famous authors to see how writing has helped them heal during their journey. And some of the results are shared in the book and it was a fabulous exercise for me. Hmm. Yeah. Now, not to get off an attention, but I noticed that you are certainly an interesting person whenever you're facing a life or death challenge like these two cancers, you go back to school and get some kind of a degree. So that is like one way for you to be a, you know, that's your healing journey, I guess. That's how you approach it, which I think is very inspirational. So I want to congratulate you for that because such a warrior uh, in some ways, but you know, not worrying 
fighting yourself, but just like looking forward, not letting yourself get stuck in the diagnosis or in the healing itself, but really going and saying, you know, this is time is precious, life is precious, and this is something I really want to do. And then you go for it. And I think that has mobilized a lot of energy for you, I can imagine. Thank you. Yes, it has. Yeah, it's true. Every time I have a health crisis, I go back to school. I don't know. <laughs> Like, why do you want to go back to school? My, I just, that's what I do. I just right. do. Exactly. <laughs> well, you have been a seeker. And I think you're mentioning also that writing and seeking is related to each other. And uh, how do we become seekers? Now, especially I'm interested in looking for that story inside, but also looking for the answers inside. Why I'm, why I'm saying this is that I got several emails from people when I announced the show that said, you know, I want to write about what really is bothering me or my history as an alcoholic or my upbringing. And so they're seeking something, but they're not really sure about what is it really what they want to put on paper. And so how do you get clarity about this? How do you find what you're seeking for to write about? You ask really great questions, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I'm always honored when people interview me that have actually read my book because there are people <laughs> kind of fake it, but I can feel you read my book. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, uh, so what I first do when I do the workshops, because there are people that come to my workshops, they know they want to write, but also they don't know what they want to write. And the first thing I have them do is list five transformative moments in their life. Hmm. And sort of in stream of consciousness, not to think too much about it, just five moments that have been impactful for them. Mm -hmm. And then ask them to pick one and write about it in length. And usually the one they pick is the one that's closest to their heart. Not always. Sometimes they end up writing about all of them. And that's how I start. And what is a transformative moment? How would you define that? A moment that was life-changing, a moment where there was a shift in either their attitude or their way of doing things. Mm. Uh, for me, my transformative moments were when I lost loved ones, when I had cancer. You know, something that puts a new perspective on your life would be but transformative. It doesn't only have to be traumatic. It can also be a positive, joyful, transformative moment. Absolutely. It could be a love affair. It could be marriage. It could be having a child. Anything that felt transformed. Yeah, it's true that a lot of writers do go to those dark places of writing about, <laughs> you know, the things that are painful because writing is healing in that way. But uh, yes, happy and sad moments. So why do you think writing is healing? You know, when I ask my clients, for example, to often they struggle with anxiety and they work through stress and negative thought spirals, mind racing. And what I notice is when they commit to the process I teach them in writing, their success rate is so much greater than then they try to do the process just in their head. And I believe the writing has this component to it of being visual, hearing your own voice inside, and also the tactile of you take a pen, there's just some, there are more senses engaged. And I think that really makes a difference when it comes to releasing. But how do you see the healing of, you write about healing emotions. How, how does writing in your uh, mind uh, heal emotions? Well, there is, the, they have done studies about the connection between the pen and the paper and the brain. And, you know, in terms of releasing, uh, releasing feelings easier than if it was like verbally expressed or you know on the computer and there are people that come to my workshops and they say i hate my handwriting i hate my handwriting but i want to write can i bring my computer and you know with trepidation i say sure um but i think after some time they end up writing in a journal too because they can carry it with them in their purse uh, it's very often the things we want to write about are not something we sit down and, you know, like that list of five, they might not, it, that, those might not be the, what the person eventually wants to write about, mm -hmm. but it might be something that they decide along when they're driving along the highway and they go, oh, that's really what I want to write about. Writing creativity happens at the most unexpected moments. You know, I'm the one that would always be pulled over on the side of the highway 
writing in my journal because I get my best ideas when I'm just on this mindless road. <laughs> so you know, just, I don't know how that works or in airplanes. I always, my first parts of all my books are always done in journals on airplanes and something about the white noise or. That's no great. Um, You're not yeah, afraid of flying apparently. No. And my, during my MFA program, my mentor said, you know, you need to do like, you need to travel around the world. <laughs> <laughs> and write a book in the plane. That's excellent. <laughs> At least one <my> book. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I can see that. But I mean, so you feel like that um, this, the writing in itself, the expression, the taking the time, all of this lets emotions out. And uh, some people say, you know, then I'm actually stuck with them because I'm reading about them, then they are on paper, then they are, you know, basically cemented, makes it even bigger and worse. What do you say to those concerns? Well, you know, James Pennebaker, who did a lot of studies on writing for healing, he would say, you know, write until it hurts and then stop and then come back to it. So, you know, there's different philosophies. Uh -huh. I'm also of the mind that, you know, some people, um, it's not so much writing about your experience. And, you know, I went to the store and then I saw someone that I really liked and we became friends and then we had coffee and we went out to dinner. I don't really, that's not the kind of write, writing for healing we're talking about. What we're talking about is the feelings you had about that experience. Right. And that's hard for a lot of people to release. You know, I used to be a medical journalist where I'd interview doctors and talk about, write about in medical innovations. And when I started doing personal writing, it was a hard shift for me because I had to, you know, suddenly... I know now journalists always give their opinions, but when I studied journalism back in the 80s, you're not supposed to give your opinion. And so your opinion and your feelings is very important in this kind of writing. Yeah, yeah. And is there a feeling for you that uh, in this day and age, writing will get lost at some point because we are just Twittering all the time or doing images now more than actually words? What, what's your sense about how this actually affects the, maybe the society or the human psyche that we don't express ourselves so much eloquently, but we are just vomiting 140 characters out there and that's it. I mean, what's your opinion about that? I don't think it's going to change. I think, you know, writing is never going to change. There's, there's always going to be pen stores and journal stores and some people will gravitate towards them, some won't. I don't think writing is ever going to go away. Well, that's very optimistic. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I just think people may start writing again as really a way to also foster something inside that may get lost. You know, I was uh, redoing uh, our website uh, with uh, some experts and they said, you know, people have such a short intention span right now they don't really want to look at text. They want to see images and then they're going to see a little text underneath. And so that's a concern, you know, that we are not seeing words as, as valuable anymore. And I think that, you know, may also diminish a little bit our way to express ourselves. So using your book, for example, as a way to get back into writing and, and have fun with it. That's what I really enjoyed about your book. You make it fun and you make it a ritual like for example the self-awareness part which i thought was uh, mm -hmm. so helpful what is how is self-awareness something that you teach how people gain more self-awareness because that is often also the hardest step to really look inside and for some the most scary step so what what do you teach people there? Well, I believe in rituals, just like any practice. I believe in rituals before you write, which whatever is feeling, whatever feels right for you. And that might be going for a walk around the block, doing some yoga, going to the gym, having a cup of coffee, having a cup of tea, just something that kind of ground, it's all about grounding, being mm -hmm. ready for the writing moment. Uh, so I teach that and I teach meditation as well prior to writing, just to kind of get all of us in the moment, group meditations are often more powerful than individual ones. And, uh, you know, that's basically how I teach people. And then self-awareness is just being in the present moment is really important. Mindfulness is a big, big word these days. So what is your ritual? 
My ritual is that I wake up in the morning, have my coffee, my double espresso. How do you? All right. <laughs> my double espresso, and I have my little dog at my feet, and I light a little candle, and often I do meditation after I have my coffee because I can't meditate with it. I know people say we should meditate first thing in the morning, but I, I need my coffee, then I do my meditation, and then I start my writing. Hmm. And you write every day? I write every day. Something, whether it's a blog, whether it's a poem, something I write or a letter. You know, the whole idea of letters, I've been doing, trying to get some pen pals going and sending letters in the mail as opposed to emails. Hmm. Again, because of the tactile connection with another person. Um, and it slows you down too. Absolutely. And uh, it certainly is something where you need to have a better handwriting than I have because I have a typical doctor's handwriting that no one can decipher, but <laughs> I can slow down and probably also improve that. Hieroglyphics, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, when we come back, we're going to talk about two things, courage, how much courage it actually takes to write and how to muster that courage and also spirituality, because you write about how spirituality is a part of that seeking and that writing. So when we come back, we'll talk about that. So stay tuned. And uh, we're here with our best special guest, Diana Rob. Welcome back to Empowerment Radio. Uh, we're here with Diana Rob about writing in her new book, uh, Writing for Bliss. <laughs> We're talking about so many books, I forgot. Uh, Writing for Bliss, which is a fabulous book. And so if you really are interested in learning how to write, getting into a routine of writing, finding the courage to write, I highly recommend this book. And where can people find your book and how can they find out more about you? Well, I have a website. It's dianarab.com, D-I-A-N-A-R-A-A-B.com. My book is available through Amazon and also where books are sold. You can um, ask your bookseller to order it for you special. A lot of people don't like Amazon these days. so. Yeah. <laughs> now, I pronounced your name just like the good German way, Ra, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Diana Rapp. Sorry for that. Well, Diana, so we talked about before courage. And uh, that is really one of those, um, you know, stumbling blocks for many people to feel like they don't have enough of that to do the writing. So you have written about it in the book. And I think you have a little bit something you would want to read from your book, maybe about courage, which I would love to hear. Yeah. Fear is a big stumbling block for writers and for a lot of people. And I remember when I was first diagnosed with cancer, my father-in-law is a Holocaust survivor. And one of the first things he said to me was, have no fear. Hmm. And so that kind of forged me forward. And I do have a big section in the book on having courage. And it's called Being Fearless and Courageous. Maybe I should, not, I don't have to hold it up. <laughs> Being fearless. And being able to take risks is essential for being a good writer. When you release your fears, you accept what happens in your life and a sense of wonder follows. When writers encounter writer's block, typically it means that fear is showing its ugly face and the unconscious mind is trying to be in control. Writing entails having a huge amount of audacity. Writing also takes a huge amount of courage, but submitting your work for publication takes even more courage. As Ernest Hemingway once said, there's nothing to writing. All you have to do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. <laughs> yeah, well, he was certainly courageous. He didn't have any fear, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, no fear. <laughs> well, so do you feel like that um, there is something to the rituals that help you then to find the courage? I mean, you said something about, you know, grounding, which certainly can bring more peace into your mind. And uh, maybe it's just like you also said, putting stuff on paper, the stream of consciousness writing, which um, how, how do you teach t uh, stream of consciousness writing? What, what would you say people should do? Well, I teach two types of writing. One is prompt-oriented prompt writing, where I give them prompt and say, let's write about your 
first love, for example, would be a prompt. Um, and then I say the other kind of writing, stream of consciousness writing, which is writing without taking your pen off the page. So the way I would propose it is open your journal, date the top of your page, and write for 15 minutes without lifting your pen off the page. If I get a blank stare from someone, I will just say for them to start out by saying, right now I feel, <laughs> and all kinds of stuff comes out. Uh -huh. and, you know, consciousness writing is not a writing like you're writing an essay with a beginning, middle, and end. It's just like kind of, anything can come out you can start writing but right now i'm feeling really scared or right now i'm really tired and you can end up talking about an event that happened 10 years ago it doesn't matter that's the beauty of it it's just stream of consciousness whatever's in your in your head at the time and that is something very healing because it really brings things out that may have been buried or you may have just not wanted to look at so uh but i also think you know you, you talk about goals and intentions. And uh, so from your book, for example, I wrote a chapter of my book or started to write in my book and in one of the chapters. And, uh, and I did this stream of consciousness writing. I had an intention. This is what I want to convey. And I think in your book, you say like sitting across a friend and sharing with a friend as if it is your, you know, your just intention to share this. And and so the stream of consciousness really brought up great ideas. It was almost like there is something inside that if I would have thought too much, I would have censored too much. And so through the stream of consciousness, it just had an easier flow to, to move out. And so I thank you for that. And sure. uh, I certainly will do this more often. But one of the things you also mentioned is spirituality. And I think you talk about, you know, spirituality as a part of the seeker, as a part of the writer. And that surprised me because not every writer would talk about spirituality, even though you say, you know, everyone has a different uh, association with spirituality. But what does it mean to you? How do you feel spirituality plays a role in writing? Well, I've never been part of any particular religious, you know, formal religion, but I am spiritual in the sense that I, I think there's a connection to connection to one another. There's an interconnectedness. There's, um, you know, there's something out there that's bringing us all together. We have a commonality. So I believe in interconnectedness. I believe in um, meditation is a huge, you know, part of my spiritual practice. And writing is actually, I actually once wrote an article on writing as a spiritual practice because it is something that connects you to your inner self, connects you and, and makes you feel better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And is that something that you felt since you have been writing for years now, more and more an awareness of your authentic self through writing? Yes, I have definitely become more aware of my authentic self and my authentic voice, which I talk about in the yes. book. And, and you use the perfect example is knowing connecting with the authentic self, one way to do that is to make believe you're writing as, you, as if you're speaking to your best friend across the table, because that's your most natural voice. And many people, when they start writing, they try to get really fancy, but really the best way that less is more and simplicity is the best. And when you're editing your work, I always suggest reading your work out loud, because mm. when you read it out loud, you find corrections, you find edits. But, you know, in the journaling process, editing is not really something that I suggest. But people feel like, you know, they don't use $50,000 words, words. They feel like, you know, they repeat themselves quite often. And uh, how do you address that? Because that is, I think, where they don't find their authentic voice. You know, not even in, only in writing, but in general in life. They may just try to be someone else or try to reach some kind of a imaginary level that they think they should in order to be worthy. So what do you tell people that feel like, I just don't have so much of a vocabulary to be a Hemingway or someone who just could grab words to describe something that, you know, they have to take a dictionary to read up what that is. Well, one thing I would say is to be a good writer, you have to be a good reader. Mm. So we all need models. We all need, you know, people that we want to emulate. So I would suggest finding someone that you like reading and read all their books to start because kind of by osmosis, you might be able to pick up their style or you get, you get inspired by 
other people also by talking to other people but reading i'm amazed how many memoir classes i teach and i ask people what their favorite memoir is and nobody raises their hand they're like i don't read memoirs and i said well if you don't read memoirs you can't write a memoir <laughs> so, <laughs> uh-huh. well, but, yeah, uh, i'm not a big fiction reader and so i i'm thinking of writing a novel but it probably won't be very good because i mainly read nonfiction. So, uh, you know, it's, you have to, you have to swim around the pools that you want to be part of. What fascinates you about memoirs? I'm fascinated by stories. I mean, I was a little girl. My mother used to, you know, take me to the library and I went right for the biography section. I just love, love stories, love reading them. They love hearing people's stories, experiences. I love the personal narrative the best. Hmm. Autobiography. Yeah. And are you gonna, I mean, you have autobiography basically already written with, you know, several books and uh, you will probably continue to do so, I can imagine. My story's out there. I mean, you know, <laughs> I just like, I'm an open book and- I think do I. <laughs> well, no, I'm, not, I'm just, I'm human. And I think other people hearing my story helps them write theirs. Yes, yes. So, um, that's, I mean, that's my mission is that that it gives people the courage to write their own story. And I always like also distinguish between an autobiography, a biography and a memoir, because people often get confused. A memoir is basically about a slice of life. It has a focus, it has the theme, whether it's, you know, surviving something in a, a difficult experience, but it's not about a whole life. An autobiography is about your whole life, A to Z. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, autobiography is about famous people you know, mm -hmm. or famous mm -hmm. people write them, I should say. And biography is also similar to um, an autobiography in that it, they're usually about famous or well-known people, and it's written in the second person. Autobiography right. and memoir written in the first person. So that's just a little distinguishing. Hmm. That. that helped. Yeah. Thank you. That was interesting. Now, you mentioned the inner child as a part of the writing process. And... Uh, I work a lot with the inner child with my clients, so I was very happy to hear about it. Now, what, how do you include or find the inner child in your writing? You know, it's so funny that you mentioned this. this is like the second interview I've had with someone mentioned the inner child, and I just stuck that little, I think it's like half a page in. It's I know, very, but it's still important. <laughs> it probably looks like it was just stuck in, but uh, it feels like it now. I'm glad I did. It's important. Uh, again, it's all about getting in touch with your, with your inner voice and just be, being real, writing your, your, your own emotional truth, no one else's. And I think that's really important in personal writing. Uh, I often use example of Tobias and Jeffrey Wolf, who are two boys that wrote totally different memoirs, totally different perspectives on life. You can grow up in the same family with someone and you would write your memoir, they would write theirs, and you would not even, you might not even know they're related. Um, so it's important when you're writing is to write your voice, not thinking about what anyone is going to say about it, not even thinking about sharing it. So mm -hmm. that, that would be getting you in touch with your inner child. But what would be your intention then for writing? What's a powerful intention for that first step to say I want to transform, which may be a little bit too far out to, you know, just bring something out or how, what would you tell people, let's have this as your first intention as you get into a rhythm of writing. I want to find out what the story is that I need to tell. Hmm. You know, oftentimes writers will say, you know, I don't write cause I want to write. I write cause I have to write. You hmm. know, there's a story that, needs to be told which is why i suggested before to list the five transformative moments because chances are one of those um moments will be something that you might want to explore mm. deeper mm -hmm. if someone says i want to just write because it feels good and i never really got into the habit what would be like three steps for them just to get started to empower themselves through writing so what would be your key suggestions because i believe that was a lot of people are hoping to to find out how can i make my journal a friend how can i do what she did 
and really become that writer, even without an audience, just for myself. Okay, so I would suggest first going out and getting getting a journal that not just any old journal where you don't even like the cover. <laughs> it has to be something that you feel like picking up, something that inspires you, your favorite colors, your your favorite. It has to have the right mood for you, mm-hmm. and it has to lay flat. You don't want a journal where you're having to, you know, hold down the binding with your elbow because it's like up like this. So it has yeah. to lay flat. Then find a pen that's comfortable for you. I love gel pens because they flow easily. I've been getting into fountain pens lately. So something that flows easily. And then the third thing is a sacred space, a place where you can feel safe and quiet and be by yourself. Whatever time of day that would be for you, whether it's first thing in the morning or at night. Mm-hmm. Paper, pen, and place are the three main things. And then rituals, of course, you can add on to that. The three Ps. But is there anything that you would say is important in regards to getting a structure, that it's daily, that it's two pages, 500 words? Or you know, sometimes people would say like, okay, 10 minutes, and after five words, they just look at the watch hoping it's going to be over. Uh, what do you suggest in order to get into this joy that you the bliss of writing well everyone's different everyone's schedule is different i usually suggest by starting for 15 minutes every morning Mm. writing and writing first thing in the morning is a really good thing because we're just we're fresh we're whatever you know is with us through the night that's a really good way to start writing first thing in the morning uh and the 15 minutes eventually might turn into an hour just have to go with the flow of it and allow yourself enough time i mean it's hard because everyone's busy, but you have to allow yourself that space. So 15 minutes is a good start. It is. And how do you overcome the inner critic who looks at your writing and wants just to tear up the pages and say, this is ridiculous. Who do you think you are? Who will ever read that? If this is something that falls into the wrong hands, you will be embarrassed. So how do you do deal with that? Ignore it. <laughs> well, you know, the inner critic gets louder the more we are ignoring it. So, <laughs> I mean, it needs I know, to get it's, something. Uh, I don't know, have therapy? I mean, um, <laughs> yes, call me. That's no problem. <laughs> well, I'm trying to get some business for you here. Uh, <laughs> I'm just selling my books, I'm getting you business. Uh, um, you know, joining writers' groups is another good way because you're. You know, giving ideas, you're exchanging ideas, you're inspiring one another. That's also another good way to see how other people write. I just warn people, new writers, especially against writers groups where you're critiquing each other's work because it becomes an ego thing and people like criticizing. Mm -hmm. So be very careful what kind of writers group you join. But being with other people is very inspiring and can help you. Or even get a writing coach to work one-on-one with you if you really have stumbling blocks, if you're really fearful. Mm -hmm. Or taking one of your classes. You do my classes. I go on my website under events. All my classes are listed there. And if you want me to come to your area and you could drum up eight, ten people, I'd be willing to come. I'm teaching at Metro University, which is a new retreat center in Northern California. near Santa Cruz. I'm teaching there at the end of February. It's a weekend and it's supposed to be incredible. Um, I'm not talking about my class. <laughs> I'm sure both of you. And I'll be at the Open Center in New York in June. And I teach at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference in June as well here in Santa Barbara. Mm. And do you do online classes as well? I don't. I like people too much. Just like you like pen and paper too much. Yeah, I like the, yeah, the connection. I'm and do you ever type and write or do you write everything just in your, I mean, handwriting on pen and paper? Well, like I said earlier, I, if I'm starting a new blog or a new article, a new essay and a new book, I'll always start it in my journal. It kind of gets me going, but then I go to my computer because it's more efficient. Mm-hmm. But do you feel it's still your friend than your computer? when you're writing into it, or is it really just the the pen and paper that has this personal connection to you? Well, it's another tool. I mean, 
you know, it's uh, it's all in the cloud. So like I mean, you know, I had fires here and mudslides. If I lost my computer and my journal, it's in the cloud. So that gives me a certain amount of comfort. But I do like Longhorn the best. Mm-hmm. Well, and I write in purple ink, by the way. Yeah, hey, but in purple. I like I write in purple ink. Ah, okay. That stimulates you too. That's actually a very nice idea to use a different color that gets your creative juices flowing. Yeah, and in, in my workshops, I usually have a big bag of different colors that I let them all try, whatever color works for them. No. Yeah, try different things. Well, and again, be courageous and be creative in that regard. Now, what about blog writing? Because a lot of people would, I mean, I talk to people that say, you know, I have a great idea for a blog for people that are chemical sensitive and want to travel. And like, yeah, that's really needed, but never happens. Simply because, you know, again, this may be a fear or this hurdle. What about blog writing? How is it something you can also give people some advice about? Yeah, in the beginning, blog writing was thought of as sort of a public journal. And I mm -hmm. think that's evolved a little bit over the years because, there, like you said, there's sometimes there's particular subjects. I blog for psychology today about transformative issues. Um, it's just finding the right place for you, wherever that might be. You know, Google, you know, whatever, wherever you, whatever you like reading, then you should try blogging there. And isn't it also true that, you know, I, I often tell people what you write there is someone out there waiting to read it. I mean, isn't yes. that also your experience that it doesn't have to be everyone going to get totally enamored what you're saying, but there may be just this audience that needs your voice and what you have to share. And, and they will never get that if you are not uh, opening up and, and have that voice. And, and for me, that was always one of the most motivating things about writing to know well, who knows how many are going to read this, but if one person already feels positively influenced by it, if one person says, wow, this really changed my way of thinking or changed my life, you've done your job. It doesn't it have to be difference. a bestseller. Exactly. Huge difference. Well, it was really a great pleasure to, uh, to have you on the show. And uh, I think this book, if you can share again the title for the book, Writing for Bliss, a seven-step plan for telling your story. From <laughs> <laughs> see, it's not <laughs> for telling your story and transforming your life. I got I got writer's block for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Speaker's block. <life. laughs> well, then you know what's really the the seven steps. I think is so great because you lead the readers from the beginning, from the first word to actually even publishing and how to go about publishing and. Uh, so if this is for you a field of interest to write, and uh, again, it's also for people that want to write just for themselves, personal stories, their journaling. But if you want to go all the way to becoming a published author, this book would be a very, very great tool to have. And then, of course, reach out to Diana and uh, find out more about her classes, which I'm sure you can also usually benefit from. So what's your website again? Diana Rat, D I A N A R A A B. Dot com. Dot com. <laughs> well, is there anything I like. A poetry section. I do have a poetry section of the book. People should know also because my yes. publisher said that people are daunted by poetry. And I started writing poetry when I was working and had very little time to write. And it was just a really great creative outlet. So I, I walk you through how to write poetry, accessible poetry that we understand. No, I writing. know that a lot of people are already breaking out in sweat because poetry seems to be so like, wow, the mastery of it all. How could I even? But that's also great about your book. It is actually made really easy and hands-on and you lose your fear of poetry. And again, it doesn't have to be pretty, but it can just be the first step and uh, you may actually find that you have talent in it. Now, is there any personal message that you want to leave the listeners with? I would just say write every day and have no fear. Excellent. And happy new year. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, this was another great hour of uh, Empowerment Radio. Thank you for being available, even though the mudslides were 
kind of blocking the road and making it hard, but you were there, so I appreciate that. And if you, the listeners, want to find out more about my work, go to the fear and anxiety solution.com. You can find out more about the book, the sessions, the workshops, and so on. Until next time, I'm your host, Dr. Friedman. Thank you. Be blessed and keep on writing. Bye.